maybe imposter syndrome is a thing and we're all probably going to be working it out for most probably 60% of our working lives and it's okay mm -hmm. and I think everything we do is a story right yeah. so um, you know anything that we're sharing with the world even if we're writing something really quickly on social media it's part of our story and we're yeah. saying something for that moment at that time so then you do the graft and the constant pitching and the yeah. constant hustling and that constantly still exists like again when younger directors get frustrated with the hustle I'm like we're real hustling all the time. All the My time. guest for this episode is Katie Posner. Katie is Joint Artistic Director and CEO of Payne's Plough, the UK's leading new writing theatre company. She's an experienced and award-winning theatre director whose beautiful productions have toured the UK and overseas. In 2023, she won a Fringe First at the Edinburgh Festival for her production of Strategic Love Play, which is transferring to the Soho Theatre in May 2024. And for her next directing project, she's taking the helm of the debut play from acclaimed novelist Philippa Gregory. Richard, My Richard opens at Shakespeare North in March and is definitely one to watch. I first met Katie back in 2013 and I'm in awe of how she's grown her directing career, taking over one of the UK's leading theatre companies and guiding it through the pandemic, whilst also managing to be an amazing mother, wife and friend. She's got so much wisdom to share when it comes to pitching, storytelling and leadership, so I'm thrilled to have her on the show. If you enjoy what you hear, please leave a review, like, comment and subscribe. It will mean the world to me and will help this podcast reach as many people as possible. You don't want to miss this. Enjoy. Katie, welcome to the show. My first question for you. In life, what's the most important thing you've ever had to pitch for? Juicy first question. Um, oh gosh, I guess, um, is that this is really random. Okay. But it's Go going to it. show you an insight into some of my thinking at the moment is, um, when I had my daughter, Heidi, um, I remember thinking, oh gosh, I've grown this little person. And uh, of course she's my daughter and I've got to nurture her and grow her. But there's no expectation that she should like me or should like engage with me. And so this like weird part of my brain went, oh, it's like not that I guess maybe not just a pitch, but that sense of like, oh, actually, like there's this little person and 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 actually I do need to engage with her like I would with any other human. And so there's a sort of that that felt like a little bit of a pitch of like, how can you really love me? And actually like how do how are we going to work together and what is this and I've always that. just really thought about that of going of course like then as she's grown up we've formed our relationship wicked little person but I guess that felt like such a like big moment in my mm. brain of like what does it actually mean to um you know build and grow relationships and what are the expectations of that um, so that feels like a really significant, important one. Um, and then I guess subsequently just um, pitching for a job that you really, really want and yeah. um, and achieving that is is a really special and extraordinary thing. And, and I think you grow and learn so much about yourself through that process. Absolutely. Um, so if those are the kind of the, the seminal pitches, if you like, what what's the one that, that's got away? I mean, in, in, in your world, there there must be you know, plays that you've hoped to direct or, um, you know, writers that you've hoped would come and, and work with the company. Is, is there anything that you thought, oh, if only I, I got to do that, I'd love to have had the opportunity? Yeah, definitely. I think um, certainly in the context of like, you know, applying for jobs and not getting them or, as you say, like going up for certain projects. But I guess there's like, when when things haven't worked out I've always gone well what what is like the value of like not being able to have um, got what I thought I wanted and how could I retain some of that so whether that's going for a job and it's not working out I'm like yeah. okay well through that process I've learned a huge amount about myself or actually if it hasn't worked out with with a certain project we're now well okay well I'm obviously not that right person so there is that sort of generosity but of course you can still have that moment where you're like, I'm actually really gutted. Uh, I think I could have done a really good job and I feel really sad. And I think you've got to own all things. Absolutely. Um, 
And I guess like sometimes with jobs, I sort of talk to um, younger or, or, or emerging directors about this and go, it, everyone says it, you know, it's really good and it's really important and you've got to go for lots of things and it might not work out. And I fully believe that. Um, but I do think um, you need to, yeah, definitely own those emotions as well of going gutted. I think it's really important because it, it, it helps you kind of understand your you know your your level of commitment to the project in in the first place but also when you're able to kind of process that emotion often you you learn something about the the process that you went through in terms of you know where you applied yourself or where you could have done things differently um but also that sometimes those moments where you have to go you know what i it's completely out outside of my control there was nothing more I could have done and if you can if you can own that then sure it's disappointing but also you kind of walk away with your with your head held high in those moments as well I think yeah oh for sure and sometimes I sort of call them demons like things we hang on to and go oh like whether that's a bit of imposter syndrome or little things that you tell yourself that you might not be as good at Mm -hmm. Um, and then you think oh actually no no that was okay I was I was good at those bits and and I can be good at those bits um so something about like being freed by these little mean demons when you go through processes and especially when you say that you feel like yeah I I definitely did what I could do yeah brilliant universe guides and that's that's the way it goes absolutely um, you are joint artistic director of the UK's leading new writing theatre company. Um, you've directed award-winning theatre productions all over the UK. Uh, you're about to direct the debut play from literary superstar Philippa Gregory, and we are going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, but before we do, take me back. So what is your story? W- what did you want to be when you were a kid? Oh, um, I always wanted to be an actor. That was just like absolutely just one billion percent my passion, like always wanting to perform and did perform. So that's how I started my career. <laughs> when you, I was you like, like in all the school plays and, uh, oh, you yeah, know, yeah, out there. Totally. Yeah. It's like, Good please stuff. give me a part. Like crying <laughs> when they didn't work out. Oh, yeah. Like in all the musicals, like, but oh, yeah, I just, I just loved it. And it was like a real graft and it was just a complete passion and, I just always was like, in my head, I just went, oh, there's no other, there's nothing else I can do. Like, this has to work out. This is, like, who I am. Um, was, there, so, yeah. was there kind of theatre in the family? Was, was Have you... No. No, not at all. Uh, my dad, well, that's not true, actually. My dad was very, very passionate about theatre. So um, we were really fortunate, like, when we were younger, he'd get, like, the super mad cheap seats right right in the back of the balcony and we'd get to see musicals and I would love it and like be obsessed and then sit in my room like on a Sunday afternoon crying listening to Blood Brothers for hours and then (laughs) say to my mum I feel really funny (laughs) she'd be like well maybe it's not the best idea to listen to this musical on loop it's quite sad (laughs) and so I just like genuinely was obsessed and then I think I got to about 14 and was like dad can't we go and see a play like surely there's other stuff um and I think that sort of then fueled my passion for for stories and plays um yeah and I guess like that that was that was just part of like who I was and I was really creative um and then as I got older I just started to really enjoy also teaching mm-hmm. um so I always um used to like badger our drama teacher at school and be like oh I could like run some stuff for some of the younger years so when I was in year 10 and 11 I was running the drama club for the year eights and nines and I just was always really passionate about also working and kind of playing um Mm -hmm. and then yeah just kind of did drama and went in and did my degree in drama and just always thought oh yeah and then you know try to be an actor um and that's where it all started um but actually I sort of realized like when I started performing I was always a bit like itchy. I was like, oh, I'd, mm. I'd do, I'd get through rehearsals and go, oh, that was really exciting. And I'd get through the first couple of like weeks of a show and then be like, ah, oh, okay. What what now? Like I, am I, like I wasn't very good at going, oh, amazing. Like each time I go on stage, I can and find something new. It just always felt like a little bit repetitive. And, <laughs> and then I started to do more and more teaching in and amongst acting. Um, and I think there was a point where I just was like, I need to earn money and I was scared and, and I didn't have any backup to 
to support. So um went, right, I'm going to do a PGCE in higher education and I'm going to teach and it's going to be amazing because it's a real big passion of mine. And actually that was a complete amazing like catalyst to how I became a director. Um, I never knew that was a thing for me, only like later on. Um, uh, now I realise what I was like in rehearsals in my head. But basically <laughs> I started <laughs> teaching in a college um I was struggling acting when it came in and teaching and just doing everything that actors you know all freelancers yeah. try and, and manage everything and then um I was working with an amazing amazing person called Mark Hartley who I always talk about because he just was the best um and he kept saying to me I think you're a director and I was like whatever whatever <laughs> I'm an actor yeah sure cool like you know and just working with students but um I think he just sort of unlocked something in my head, which was like, oh, actually, like there is a space of like visual um, storytelling in the way that I approach stuff. And oh, OK, mm. there's something interesting there. Anyway, um, I did that for a, a, a bit of, like quite a long time. And um, and he then um, he was also a producer. He went back into the industry and I was going back into industry as well after um running national um theatre diploma courses and head of drama and theatre studies a level um and he gave me my first directing opportunity as part of the company that he ran oh, jam wow. theatre company um uh with a fantastic uh amazing team and i just remember going oh my gosh like what like that's that's amazing and I'm, I'm kind of wild and i was like oh god yes 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 i would love that opportunity um, and it was to direct the government inspector Adrian Mitchell's translation. Yeah, yeah cast of eight. It was, should have been a, a cast of sixteen. And I just remember meeting all these actors and going, "Oh, oh yeah, hi, I'm Katie Pauls, and I'm the director of the show." And inside, going, "Oh my, what? Yeah. This is insane!" Like laughing at myself, going, "No, this is this is wild." And this is kind of my brain that, that I always go, oh, "I'll be fine. It'll be fine." I jump in, and then when I'm starting to sink, I'm like, "Oh yeah, I probably should have thought about this." But anyway. <laughs> It was, it was thankfully good. And we had, and actually um, he sent me, he just recently sent me the poster image from this play, which just moved very much down. Um, and it was amazing. And it was such an opportunity to feel trusted to, mm. to you know, to direct the show as a younger, um, uh, you know, emerging director, having like just worked with in the student and, and university context of directing yeah. work. Um, and actually, it was just really uh, like that sort of epiphany moment of going, oh, actually, like this does feel right. And I feel yeah. really like instinctively guided in my brain. And actually, the more I started to work with actors, I thought, oh, actually, like when I was in shows, I'd be kind of in my brain going, oh, if someone just you, if you moved there and, and you did that. And, you know, just thinking in that way. I didn't yeah. tell the directors that because that's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I guess from that moment, I started to go, oh, this feels really right. And then started to look for other opportunities. And there was a point where I was um, still acting and I was directing and I was teaching. And um, I met like a very influential director and he sort of went oh you know you have to pick one you're, you're wearing all these hats that's crazy pick one pick one pick one what are you what are you and I sort of went oh I'm a director and I think that's actually wrong because I think you can be all three mm -hmm. you, you can be as many things as you like so park that but yeah. I think what it did is it forced me to go actually yes that is where I feel so aligned like that creatively so stimulating I love empowering people I love telling stories um and I love uh, it's such a privilege to go like oh you read something and then you know you're sharing that with an audience and I love people and so mm -hmm. it all kind of made sense I was like oh of course this this all makes sense anyway it wasn't that it was all then handed like obviously then you do the graft and the constant pitching and the yeah. constant hustling and that constantly still exists. Like, again, when younger directors get frustrated with the hustle, I'm like, oh, we're real hustling all the time. All the time. It's never easy. There is never, like, that simple way of just going, yay. And, you know, in, in any job, it's it's always about growing and developing. So I think, yeah. And I, and I guess I never looked back. Like, I never, uh, like, teaching always, it's it's always a massive passion of mine. When I was freelance, I, I continue to teach and I love it. Yeah. Um, but I never looked back to acting um mm -hmm. I always oh, although I did get asked if I um would do a very small part in a film when I was pregnant with my daughter 
And I thought, oh, I, I should do this because I need to remember like how scary and vulnerable it is it to is. be on the front line, as you know. Um, but I was really sick. So I was like, I don't think I can be <laughs> on the start feeling really ill, being very rusty. Maybe I'm fine. And so, yeah, no. No so, so maybe a bit of spear carrying in in the future yeah. just to just to get yeah, keep, your, keep your eye in <laughs> yeah exactly yeah like, the, the theater like in the uk i suppose is historically very kind of tough world for for women very male dominated quite a kind of exclusive club how, how have you kind of broken down some of those barriers and, and grown your career? Like what sort of obstacles have you faced as you've, as you've worked your way um, through the business? Um, I think, I mean, yeah, there's, there are lots of barriers for many people in many ways. Um, I guess I've always tried to advocate for, um, you know, equity. Yeah. Um, I've always tried to um, be aware of, you know, if I'm doing a show, like who who's part of my creative team and, and, and what does that mean in terms of representation yeah. and um, around obviously extending that in terms of um, having women as part of that. Um, I guess like trying to be authentically yourself. I actually had a conversation with someone about, you know, particularly when um, I became a mum, I remember kind of getting, and, I, and I'd just become freelance a couple of years later, and I remember getting meetings where um people were talking to me about oh you know would you be up for coming to do the family show um you know mid-scale family shows and I was like oh this is really cool but I think in the back of my head I was like well don't be targeting me now because I'm uh you know a female freelance director and therefore you're just giving me the family shows there's nothing yeah. wrong with the family shows like it's like oh my gosh like what an opportunity um but I think I was just quite aware so I guess like trying to um I don't know just like do the graph do the hustle I think um have you had mentors have you had sort of people that have cham yeah, championed yeah, you yeah, or so. been sounding oh yeah for you? yeah I have um I think I've been really fortunate like having the opportunity to be in York and um I got to direct a lot of work like that's an amazing amazing thing and I felt really trusted i think negotiating any industry um it, it, in terms of like gender representation can be quite challenging and sometimes mm. you have to uh particularly as a younger female uh, uh, and in quite um i would say probably quite a male dominated environment um kind of through my formative years you sort of have to negotiate that but i guess it was exactly that reaching out to extraordinary women like i've got amazing female colleagues who are great friends um and yeah like mentors would really support me yeah um and i don't think i really knew what a mentor was at first i sort mm. of was like oh like what does that actually mean but um i think over the last like four years i've gone on like you know uh particularly since becoming um an uh, artistic director and a leader like going through coaching and understanding like authenticity and self mm -hmm. and that's probably because I'm getting older as well but like yeah. part of that journey has been about like what do you need around you in order to be your best self mm. and they're always you know there's difficult things that you have to navigate um and then I guess as you do have those opportunities to progress, it's then going, right, like how are you pulling everyone around you up and bringing people on board and, um, yeah, trying to make those waves mm. in order for the next people to, to, to have step better. Up. Yeah, and step in. in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the Payne's Plough application process because I know that was a, a massive pitch for you I, I actually remember meeting you in central London around the time that you were kind of interviewing for it and just remembering how like high the the, the stakes were so what what was that like yeah you because know, that was taking your career to a different level yeah oh gosh yeah yeah you've been amazing to me um definitely as a fantastic ally and, and coaching like arm um, to all of that as well and um, 
I think it was, yeah, I guess like um, what an opportunity to apply for something with somebody that you really like, who's a really great friend, who's, um, you know, a great sort of, you've been real champion of each other's work for so mm. long. So it felt like such a no brainer to approach um, that job together. Um, I, it was at a point really, um, being very honest, um, I had just recently gone freelance, uh, there was lots of stuff coming up and I was like, oh, I don't know, like, you know, and a little bit scared because, mm. um, actually when you go for something with someone else, the stakes, for, for, this was me personally, I felt they were a lot higher because I was like, I don't want to let Charlotte down. Yeah. What if I'm rubbish? Like, <laughs> so you have that anyway, you're like, oh God, what if I'm really bad and this is dreadful and I, and I absolutely like mess up. Oh, okay well I could just deal with that and have to like silently process that misery but if you're going into something with someone you're like oh no this is like a lot um and I do remember like yeah she was re- she was always really amazing and just was like yeah we're gonna we'll go for it we're gonna get it and I was like ah, okay um and actually I think you know if I were to be going through that journey now, I think I'd feel very different because I'm mm. like, yeah, you should go for everything and think you're going to get it. Like these are all these horrible things that we tell ourselves and they're not cool and I'm not going to do that anymore. So this is me like four and a half years later. Um, but yeah, it just felt like, yeah, I guess the stakes are really big. Um, but it really felt like, um, and I think this is how I feel about all sort of new leadership jobs or where I hope, you know, career will develop or whatever, is just being incredibly um, aligned with uh, like what it would mean for you to do this job. Yeah. And I guess like it was just that a real passion for the organization, both me and Charlotte had absolutely spent like our formative like career really championing and developing writers and and directing new Mm. writing so it was like gosh like this is like wow that would be an amazing opportunity to do a job like that so I think it was just kind of taking all of that and going yeah we could totally do this job and um and we can do it as ourselves yeah and who we are and we don't have to pretend to be other people or what we think we should be or what the industry thinks we should be actually um we're like massive you know we've both done loads of work regionally that feels like a real passion and a pull to pains plow you know we love writers to I guess like all the ingredients were there. It didn't mean that we were going to get the job. And I remember after the first interview, she was like, oh, it went terribly. And I was like, oh, I thought it went all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but but then then the the next interview, I was like, oh, I don't know. And, you know, so it was back and forth. Um, and it was really exciting to to get the call, to get the job. I saw on the, the job. on the Pain Plow, uh, Pain's Plow website that you, you you shared the text messages that you had back and forth on the, oh, on, yeah. on the day. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> on the, oh, yeah, on the day yeah, that, really I mean, so t- just waiting, waiting for that news must be the. I mean, I remember it as an actor. You know, you you thinking, well, they they'll have cast it by now. They'll have definitely cast. I mean, they're it's starting in a week's time, and you, you know, all of that anxiety builds up inside you, and then the phone goes, and you're like, okay, give me the bad news, and it's the good news, and yeah, one wonderful feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We were texting each other then. Like, oh. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Probably not got it, you know, like that sort of negative thing. And again, like, I'm just not going to do that anymore. Um, And yeah, and then it was really cool. And I remember I was in Guild or Guildford even. Yeah. And I was directing Anne Boleyn, Howard Brenton's uh, Anne Boleyn, and which was such a juicy, brilliant piece to do with drama school students. It was so creative. I was having the best time. I was like, this is so cool. And I remember getting a message from Charlotte being like, the chair wants to talk to us. Can you leave? And I was like, I'm in rehearsals. Okay, two minutes. And I was like running into like a corridor where everyone was getting out there flipping violins and whatever. And I'm like, oh, no. Um, hello? <laughs> I was like literally like cocooned myself, like waiting to be told, oh, we haven't got the job. And then when we got told, I was like, oh, that's amazing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um so that's nice. Sometimes when it does get like quite tough, I think about that moment and go, oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> that feeling. Cause it's always the best part, isn't it? When you get you get what you really want and then like the next part of your brain goes, oh, gosh, now I have to do it. Oh, yeah. Ah. And, and um, also I've got to get back into the rehearsal room because I've got 20, yeah, yeah, 20 actors go, waiting for me. Be really cool and be like, yeah, sorry, guys, I just had to take a quick call, like <laughs> thinking, 
oh my <laughs> like oh my goodness just like got the dream job that's wild yeah it was really cool and it was so fun yeah I loved doing that show as well it felt really freeing it's interesting isn't it like what fells it, and it's not they didn't have stakes but just felt like that space to be like mad creative mm. um yeah you must you must get that opportunity quite a lot actually to give other people that that lovely news yeah. of you know That's yes I can imagine yeah. It's, it must be so you must good. be like kind of the fairy godmother you're just kind of granting people's wishes it's it's really oh. good um in terms of you know pitches and people pitching to you as as joint artistic director you're obviously getting you know pitched play ideas uh, all the time uh, how how do you like to be pitched to so what what do you think the kind of ingredients of a of a winning pitch are and i know it's subjective but i'm just curious what what appeals to you um i guess it sort of depends on what the pitch is so mm -hmm. obviously we talk a lot with writers and when we're thinking about new commissions or plays that are gonna be programmed in the roundabout um there's a specificity i guess in like what you know ideas and um who why tell this story now and just trying to kind of like unpack some of those thoughts i guess um I think passion and again, I come back to authenticity and sort of meaningful um, conversations. And maybe because this is part of my own work of like, you know, being obsessed with Brene Brown, but like actually going like I, I really want to talk about this piece. Like it feels really important. Like there's, I guess, like an audience awareness if, mm -hmm. if we're being really specific, yeah. like, um, I think it's quite challenging. Um, uh, sorry, and um, when um, you're just sort of going, and I'd really like to tell this story with no thought of of an audience, and I guess yeah. that's what um, yeah. is part of it. So I think, yeah, uh, passion, energy, um, focus, um, yeah, those kind of things. But if I guess if I was thinking about someone coming to work at Payne's Power for a job interview, um, I think pitching themselves again, like with their sort of like, like what does the organisation do and and where, what, how can they bring their best self? Yeah. Um, and yeah. then kind of relaying that back in regards to the organisation. I think mm, really for me, again, personally, it's about, you know, understanding values and people's values and going, do they align with the values of the organisation? And if so, that will feel like quite, you know, the best fit. So I guess it's like trying not to think about what the other person second guessing. Because yeah. I think then if you do if you don't second guess and you're like cool if it doesn't work out at least I have been authentic at least I've said what I've wanted to say and at least it's felt passionate and I've believed in something if you're second guessing you're living outside your truth and that is hard mm. um, because then again if it doesn't work out you're like oh well I you know maybe I just yeah beat yourself up so be truthful I think that that kind of goes across into you know all moments of leadership as well I, i'm sure you have yeah. uh you know times when you're talking to the organization as a whole and you you can you can feel when that alignment's there and when it's when it's misaligned or if you're holding something back then the the, the quality of that kind of communication and and i suppose then the the result and the output of that communication diminishes massively um you you kind of were leading Payne's Plough for about what six nine months and then Covid hit um and and you know, theatre and the arts were really badly affected as as were many other kind of industries but it felt like the theatre almost kind of collapsed overnight so how how did you as uh, co-artistic directors sort of pitch to keep the company alive um, and, and what did you learn about resilience and reinvention along the way? Oh, gosh. Um, I think, like everybody, we just went, oh, what's happening? You know, um, and sort of dealt with it as it as it was hurtling towards us. I guess we were new. So we had this like 
tremendous energy and momentum to go it's fine it's fine we can repurpose stuff we can do all you know our our commitment was always to writers let's make sure that we're commissioning writers people are really struggling to be paid let's make sure we're paying people um like making sure that we're still delivering our freelance contracts like all of that stuff just felt like an absolute no-brainer um and then of course um that was the year uh, yeah it was actually yeah in covid we launched the women's prize for playwriting so we were like oh that feels really active so I guess we hadn't run the organization for long enough to know it as in like to know how it worked without COVID. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. But yeah. So we kind of went, oh, okay, well, there just there just has to be another way. Um, but we went a hundred miles per hour. We mm. did not stop. Like we were like, right, go, 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 go. Like the it was just wild. And that's kind of nuts to be like, okay, and we just sat in our you know, at our desks, working it out like the world was. And I remember actually having a really good conversation with quite an experienced ED who was like, you might just want to like think that you're not going to make live work for probably like the next year and a bit. And I was like, no, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Like, we'll, we'll be out there in May. And then you're like, no, oh, no, 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 definitely not. And I think so that like energy and charge <laughs> worked in our favour, but also you haven't been in the role long enough to go okay we probably like need to think a bit longer term um so it, yeah I, I remember when I was in rehearsals in 2021 which was the 2020 season pushed into 2021 yeah and I suddenly thought oh gosh I'm really tired mm. maybe maybe we should have thought about that and then or maybe like furloughed ourselves a little bit or just try to maybe yeah take little pauses um so I guess you learn as you go of course um and in that you're building resilience because you're just having you're having to change your business plan constantly Mm. and repurpose like everyone was doing and then it obviously it felt really scary and so suddenly being able to make work and have it out there um was just felt like such privilege and so special um yeah I just was like gosh like let's hang on to this and and not forget that um so I think yeah you build resilience as much as you can don't you and then you you continue yeah have you have you been able to build that recovery like in more for yourself now because I I mean I know that your your life is still full there's still so much going on um are you able to to take those moments to to kind of pause and regroup um yeah I try to definitely um and again that's um yeah I think that's why I kind of reached out to think about um sort of personal growth as you go on a leadership journey because actually going through that and having support and going through coaching it does ask a lot of you to think about well who am I like what Mm. does it mean for me to lead and again like if you're talking about authenticity and your authentic self then actually you do understand what do you need personally to be your best self Um, so I think actually that was a kind of springboard for me from 2021 to go, oh, I think that feels like a really exciting thing to to work out. And so in that, it is, yeah, going like, do I need this the balance of this team or or what does that look like? Yeah. So I guess, yeah, I've I got better at going. Uh, and I'm also a mum. I need to see my baby. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? And like we should not be in um in any industry saying that we can't be family we can't have families and we can't you know I listen I'll always be riddled with guilt mom guilt but um I definitely go no I am going to take my holiday as much yeah. as I can um yeah but as we know things build up and suddenly you know you're in pre production for a show you're doing other stuff you've got a big prize like it, it can feel like it all builds um. And so I think it is just trying sometimes to retain like, okay, I need to, yeah, give that little bit of space or something that needs to just roll into the next week. I was trying to manage stuff. Yeah. And it is, it's managing that, that is, it's challenging, but if you get it right, it's very liberating. I always think that, that theater and and (laughs) film and and TV, (laughs) um, that they're, they're quite unique in in terms of industries where you are often bringing a high performing team together and by by the time you have that kind of first 
kickoff moment. Yeah. Six weeks later, maybe three months later at the very most, the, yeah. the product, the thing has been yeah. produced and is out there. And if you look at most businesses, that yeah. kind of development cycle for a new product or a new idea is like three years or something. Yeah. Uh, and so, so we do put ourselves under a huge amount of kind of pressure yeah. that other industries maybe kind of don't don't have but but i'm always curious what what can other industries learn from the way that you know theater and and tv work so when you bring that team together like what do you have to do as the leader to make it function and not just function but but perform like what 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 tactics do you have for for making everyone gel in a relatively short amount of time mm. Um, what do, I, I, do you mean in terms of like when I'm directing? Yeah, when you're yeah. like you've, you've you know you've dis you've show's been commissioned, you're working yeah. with the producer, and then you have to decide who's my designer, who's my lighting yeah. designer, who's the costume designer. You have to cast. You, like, mm -hmm. what's the process of bringing that team together? Um, I guess like trying to ensure everyone's on the same page. I think like the more shows and the more work I've done, um, I've always seen like the best results is where, you know, it, it have been where everybody has got what they need mm -hmm. and including yourself. Yeah. So it's like, you know, doing doing all the work with the designer to bring in the lighting designer to bring in the movement. Like so so that everyone is understanding the kind of visual picture of something. And then you are all going on that journey, but recognizing that it isn't going to be smooth sailing and it is going to be rocky and it is going to be hard mm -hmm. and I've never done a process which hasn't got to a point mainly in week three where everyone suddenly feels really nervous or there's tension and I think that is challenging and that is hard and that's where you know you have to also take on your own personal vulnerabilities of like well brilliant I've put this vision together and I think this is going to be amazing but oh oh maybe it's all unraveling and maybe it's not good and but you uh as the person who is like essentially steering the ship can't mm -hmm. go hey dudes there's all these icebergs I'm a bit worried we're approaching you've got to work it out and of course you can have your allies in that and you can find people who have got your back but you you do have to um take a lot on and you mm. have to kind of yeah I think there has to be a real strength and um that kind of resilience that we're going to get through and we're going to be okay and it's going to be great um, but yeah, I guess um, I'm quite interested in um, Bruce Tuckman's the, the forming, norming, storming, storming and performing. Yeah, because um, yeah, I just always go, it always happens. And actually, inevitably, we need each of those stages to yeah. form as groups of people. And we need to norm and storm or whatever the right order is in order to perform. Yeah. And I guess I always think we will get there. I would hope that... Um, you know, I like a process to be really positive and for mm -hmm. people to have a good time. And sometimes that's to my own detriment because I'll go that extra like 110% to go, I really want it to be great and everyone have a really good time. Not just a good time, but as in just do their best work. Yes, yeah. And maybe I can probably over, like I'll probably push myself a bit more to ensure that. And sometimes I have to go, well, actually, is that my responsibility? And actually it, you've put a team of people together because they're all brilliant yeah um but yeah i think i think leading with uh, we always you know i guess again sort of stealing this but like leading with kindness isn't just about going oh, i'm really nice to everyone and we have a nice time it's going right i have like you know we're all on this journey we've got big expectations we've got to meet a deadline and we're going to do that mm -hmm. um but i just want you to be your best self and i want you to bring your whole self and um yeah supporting people in yeah. that way um yeah but it's 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 interesting because as much as you plan and try and get the right balance of the right humans to tell the right story in in the way and, and you know what that all looks like sometimes it doesn't work out and sometimes they're real challenging things you have to deal with or yeah. sometimes things aren't ready or you're approaching previews and and you're scared or you're like I don't know and and actually if I'm being super vulnerable and honest most shows I'll call my friends and be like oh I don't know ah. <laughs> and they go it, it will be great you always say this and it's amazing and I'm like no you can't say that it's not a blanket rule every show is different and then if you know if it's gone on to have good success they're like see I told you, you, told you. Like, yeah no <laughs> it still doesn't 
doesn't work. And maybe <laughs> this is either to my detriment or a good thing. I think I start each thing going. I ho- like you can never measure your last show and y- your next show and your last one. That's How true. can yeah. you? No. Every project is completely different. You can't be like, well, that one was really good, so this one's going to be great. It doesn't mm. work like that. So each one feels new and fresh, and I guess that's why I love what I do. Yeah. Um, because you can't get bored. <laughs> no, that's absolutely true. It's it's a it's about presence, isn't it? That you you do just you you have to be in that moment in in the mm-hmm. rehearsal room or in that production meeting, um, and meet those challenges where they are. The, the 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 kind of wheels tend to fall off the bus if you're too far ahead of yourself or you're you're kind of stuck in the past. Um, let, let's let's move up the conversation over a little bit to storytelling because it would be really remiss of me to have you uh, as a as a director and a dramaturg uh, on the show without talking a little bit about that. So, what what advice can you give to listeners to become better storytellers in in any aspects of their lives? So, you know, some people will be working in an office. Some people might be wanting to be better rank, raconteurs in a pub. Um, there might be some professional playwrights listening. So, so what what kind of should people be thinking about if they want to tell good stories? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, why do you want to tell the story? And who who are you telling it to? Mm-hmm. And I think everything we do is a story, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, anything that we're sharing with the world, even if we're writing something really quickly on social media, it's part of our story. And we're yeah. saying something for that moment at that time. So I think I often think of things as a story. And, and that's also like when I'm writing a paper or something for the Arts Council or whatever, it's going, if there's a narrative in a story, then actually that's how you get people engaged and, and you connect with humans because mm. we're all telling stories all the time. Um, so I think it is there it's from those starting points. Obviously, if you're writing a play, um, you are starting from a point of like, why do you want to tell this story and what does it mean to you? Um, and then going on that journey to craft it. Um, and then I guess like, yeah, if you're just thinking about how am I uh, amplifying my business and who am I communicating that with and how mm. do they know that this is an absolutely brilliant pub? Like, why would they want to come in? What's their experience? What What are they going to feel when they come in? What is their story from mm. walking in the door to buying their drink, to sitting in their seats, to leaving? Like, that's a story. That's brilliant. Yeah. And actually, like, it's so exciting when you see that in the context of businesses, like, because you're right, it's, it's for for everyone isn't it and actually that's an amazing way to go uh you know all businesses or or you know communication is about story yeah and um, actually like I quite often like approach things and and use the term story beating because it helps my brain because I work with so many scripts so you're yeah. constantly going like when you yeah you're looking for the story beat you're like well what is that or what's missing or um actually we just need an anchor there and i and i really do approach that way of working across like mostly yeah that, everything that's really interesting the, the the editing piece must be one of the biggest challenges when working with with new writers and i and i always think when you know when i'm working with with clients and we're you know thinking about telling the story of a, a product or a business it's 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 sometimes the most important things are the things that you take out like there's there's sometimes mm-hmm. a desire to to share it all but that becomes kind of overwhelming how how, how do you approach the uh the business of of kind of editing someone's you know baby essentially with a with, with a writer how how do you help them kind of understand what works and what doesn't um, I guess it's not, you know, it's never you editing that, is it? Like you're you're collaboratively yeah. just sharing your, um, you know, looking at craft and sharing your thoughts. Um, I guess I always try and like come at it through the context of an audience. Um, and and I think um, most writers will, you know, want to go on that journey. And, and sometimes yeah. plays have to go through a process where they feel 
you know, absolutely bursting at the seams with loads of stuff in order to understand what is the kind of anchor and, and crux of the story and how mm -hmm. are you wrangling that together. So I think it's always trying to like, A, firstly understand a play, like ask those questions. I mean, if you're working as a director, tend not to just, um, I, w I would always bring a, a dramaturg um, in, that, in that sort of orbit because... Yeah. That feels really important because sometimes directors can be like, uh, like visually, you know, get into their own sort of brains. Um, yeah. And I think it's really important to as you're wrangling that sort of those early drafts that it's the writer have got to have like full autonomy of like, what is the play? and What are they trying to say? Um, and so but but yeah, I guess if I'm extensively working and, and helping support scripts, I think it is just about asking those questions, trying to get and understand and get inside someone's head in order to help pull and wrangle. And sometimes mm. it's really helpful, isn't it? Like any outside eye, you see stuff. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah, sometimes you have to also go like, yeah, is is this, you don't want to like push someone in a direction that they don't want to go in. Cause then mm -hmm. again, it's not authentic to them. Yeah. Um, and editing and cutting is, is challenging sometimes for writers because it feels hard, doesn't it? And sometimes you can go on a process where you go, actually, maybe if that, stuff is edited out it can still exist it, it it might be that like as you're getting into rehearsals you come back to it you know if it feels there's a necessity for that so sometimes mm. that's a useful um way of working with writers to just go let's park that but actually it might come back it in. might or come back as we're getting something on the screen you might go no it absolutely is the right call um yeah. i think it's just trust and collaboration that that phrase getting it on its feet i think is really important whatever context mm -hmm. you're you're working in whether you're you know yeah. writing a play or or preparing a presentation like sometimes it, the the kind of logical process of editing by getting a script or you know taking out bits of powerpoint is is yeah. you know might might seem to work but then you actually try and speak the words out loud and realize that it it doesn't and you need to bring that bit back or that bit needs to go there and you need to yeah. rearrange so yeah. i think that 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 kind of you know physical exploration of it is is massively important too yeah um, it was just made me think about um when i write stuff like say if i'm writing papers or whatever for the business my brain is running like a hundred billion miles per hour and I always like I'm like right 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 and then I read it back and I'm like oh I've written like the end in the middle and so it's always that sort of thing that I have to go okay like re rework stuff because um yeah my brain's going a chaotic down so I've noticed that about myself so I have to triple check my emails step, um, step back but, yeah. yeah and and, yeah, and proof yeah. So you're about to direct um, the debut play from Philippa Gregory, who's one of the UK's most loved novelists. Um, listeners will probably know her for The Other Berlin Girl. Um, how, how did that come about? How Did you pitch her? Did she pitch you? What happened? <laughs> no, um, it was an approach from the two producers, Shakespeare North uh, and Barry St. Edmunds and with Daniel Schumann. Um, it was, um, yeah, an approach of, you know, would you be interested in a project like this? And then, of course, you have to go through the meetings and, and meet with Philippa. Um, and I remember our first meeting, uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is Philippa Gregory. Wow, uh, this is nuts. And I was actually in rehearsals for a play that I was doing, Strategic Love Play by Mar Miriam Batty in the summer. And I was like, oh, I've just got to get on Zoom at the end of the day feeling like oh a bit nervous um and she was just so warm and incredible uh and so up for going on a new writing journey because you know she's obviously an extraordinary <clears throat> prolific amazingly talented novelist like she's a roaring success um but it's a debut play so you still got to go on a journey as a writer writing a play and I just loved our first like this first meeting we just ended up working really right. um and started to get kind of stuck in and at the end I remember her saying well it just feels like we're working and I was like oh, okay and I think she said um uh, she said oh so some of the, the purpose of this meeting is to see if we like each other and I was like Oh, like you know, wanting to be like, well, do you like me? <laughs> Trying to be a bit cool. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. See yeah. if we like each other. <laughs> um, 
but yeah anyway thankfully that worked out um and so yeah it's you know it's an opportunity and and, and that is um outside of pain's plan so it's a, a chance to think about you know doing a piece that we wouldn't um have been able to normally do, do uh, in yeah context yeah yeah so it's nice yeah it's, and it's good to look at historical stuff because you know there's very many contemporary uh, connections with what the play is. I can imagine. Uh, am I right in thinking that it's in iambic pentameter as well? Um, that, yeah, in and out. She's kind of crafted a, a really exciting piece. So yes, yeah. Wow. Okay. So there's a good. I mean, but, but when you when you're thinking about casting. Uh, that and I, I know that uh, as we speak, you're probably in the, in the process of bringing the the team together. Um, how you know, how how do you go about finding the the right people to to tell that story? What are you what are you looking for in in the cast when you're working on you know something that is so new and different? Um, well, you work with great a great team so you work with a great casting director uh, and and I think it is then kind of um amplifying the vision for how you want to tell the story uh she's it's called Richard my Richard and that is Philippa's ownership of Richard the third in the eyes of Philippa and I guess I've kind of embraced that and gone in Richard the third and these historical figures in the eyes of me mm -hmm. they are going to look you know feel different to every single person who would want to tell you know the story of of historical characters so i think it is about going yeah i think for me like obviously amazing actors but um actors that fit in the world you're imagining yes yeah um, so yeah i think going through audition process and and you can have an idea of what you think but actually when you know as you're in that process you suddenly go <gasps> And like, or your spine goes tingly and you're like, this is, oh, this is so exciting. So yeah, I quite mostly just love actors because I think they're amazing. And I think it's really hard to go into the audition room and try and be yourself, best self mm -hmm. in like a 15, 20 minute, 30 minute slot. It's wild. And so yeah. I'm always like, I know that feeling as you do. And so I would hope that like, you know, I always want actors to feel like they've worked a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of with me. So I'm like, always like, oh, like just try and feel like we've just had a little bit of a play together so that it yeah it feels like they've gone okay cool I'm I'm satisfied with what I brought I mean that doesn't always exist I'm I'm sure I'm not always but I good think enough to do that but that's what I aim to do I think that brings us right back to to what we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation about you know do, do you walk out of the room and feel like you've given it your best shot and i and i think yeah. you know yeah. that's that's all you can do in any in any audition interview whatever situation because as as you've just articulated you're you've got an idea of who you think that character is in in your mind and and they might be brilliant at the way that they've yeah. just read the lines but yeah. they just don't quite fit that that vision so i think you know personal performance is 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 so um wrapped up in in this idea of us uh achieving the 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 outcome but actually i think if we take a step back and say did i did i give it my best shot yeah. the the outcome you know may not actually end up being there but if you can walk out with your head held high uh that that counts for a, a huge amount yeah defo and you know like it, honestly nine times out of ten like you know there's been other things that you're like oh that actor was so brilliant and you're all you're recommending them or you know the casting yeah. directors that i work with they're incredible and they're like yep they might not be right for this but they are logging them for other yeah. stuff so it it genuinely does yeah that does work as well that's good to hear um katie i could i could chat forever but i'm gonna yeah. wrap things up um uh, i've got a final question for you if if you could go back and give that 13, 14 year old girl sitting in their bedroom, listening to Blood Brothers on, on loop, uh, a, a piece of advice. What, what would you tell her? Oh gosh, loads. Um, what would I tell her? I think I would say, Oh no, I don't know. There's so many things. Um, I think I would say that um, I guess that maybe imposter syndrome is a thing, and 
we're all probably going to be working it out for most probably 60 percent of our working lives and it's okay um and I think to embrace you and your journey actually that's a better one I think like I always used to think oh you know I started my career as an actor and I didn't go down a sort of linear director's route and I sort of found it a lot later and then I've kind of worked it out and been round the houses and back and 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 I used to sort of feel like oh a little bit of a pang and like seeing other people who may have gone on and I don't know studied English and then found their way in um and actually like I'm like no it's all right it's good like you you you, you grab little pieces of really cool things and um my painting is all wild and chaotic but it's colorful and that's okay so that's what I would tell my 13 year old self that your pathway your journey is all right i love it thank you so much for joining me on the podcast thanks for listening to the why life's a pitch podcast if you'd like to improve the way you pitch and communicate i'm giving away a special gift to all my listeners we've developed the pitching with impact scorecard to help you benchmark your pitch performance in six key areas it will take you less than five minutes to complete and you'll receive a detailed personalized report packed full of insights and ideas to help you improve and grow. Just head over to dominiccalento.com forward slash scorecard to get started.